The climate and oceans are in crisis. My name is Jack Etkin. Peter Carter is a retired family physician and emergency doctor who practiced medicine in both England and Canada for over 40 years. So, Peter, what are you doing in your retirement? Well, I'm one of those lucky uh, people, I guess, who are very busy in their retirement, Jack. Um, what, I, what I find myself doing is, which I enjoy, is uh, presenting at international science and climate change and ocean change uh, conferences uh, around the world. So I started this website called stateofourclimate.com. And I started monitoring the atmospheric greenhouse gases sort of every couple of months because, you know, you had to wait until there was a time for an increase. And then I found that I was doing it every month. I'm now doing it every week or 10 days. That is the speed at which atmospheric carbon dioxide concentration is increasing. Um, this is truly, truly unprecedented. So what I um, discovered, in a sense, by following atmospheric carbon dioxide concentration closely, was that in 2015, atmospheric carbon dioxide concentration jumped by three parts per million in one year. Um, the average uh, was two parts per million over the past 10 years, which was sky high. That in actual fact, an increase going up to three parts per million in a year was unprecedented in Earth history. Uh, we're now living on a planet that humans have never inhabited before. And the climate, people have to understand, particularly the younger people, the climate determines everything. To put things in a nutshell, in how bad a situation we're in. Every single aspect of the data that I follow, ocean acidification, ocean heat, global surface temperature, um, uh, atmospheric carbon dioxide concentration, methane concentration, nitrous oxide concentration, glaciers, loss of uh, summer snow cover in the far north, loss of summer sea ice, which is well, all these things are accelerating. And as I well know from the IPCC, because I'm an expert reviewer of the, inter of the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, as I well know, in order to avoid planetary catastrophe, global emissions of greenhouse gases not only carbon dioxide, but as the IPCC has quite rightly said, methane and nitrous oxide have to be declining now. The result of this is that in the United States, we have a complete um, dangerous climate change denying government, as I call them now. They are the most dangerous people in the world, these dangerous climate change deniers. Um, their leaders, like pre now President Trump, um, I would regard as uh, possibly, almost certainly, the most dangerous man that's ever lived. So uh, this is nothing new. It's a, it's a new level. It's a, it's a terrifying new level, though, of uh, power and obstruction of the world being able to deal with climate change. To give you an example, uh, which is a very telling example, just recently, there was a minister, there was a meeting of the G20 ministers. And at the meeting, uh, the, the media reported that the United States and Saudi Arabia had managed to exclude for the first time from their report, from the G20 report, any mention of global climate change. So there we have these two governments holding the entire world, um, it's not to ransom, but um, uh, um, preventing the entire world doing what the world has to do so that we, so that the young people, my sons, grandchildren, so they have a future. And um, this is the crime of all time. And I've been calling it the crime of all time for some years. I mean, it absolutely obviously is. We're looking at um, an unprecedented extinction on Earth. If these people continue to exert the evil power 
that they're exerting, if, if they're allowed to continue, we are going to see, maybe I won't, but it won't be soon after, we are going to see the worst extinction event on Earth ever. That if we carry on on this heading, we're headed, we have the planet, we have nature, we have all life headed on the worst extinction event ever. We're damaging the entire Earth, and not only that, we're damaging it forever. And that's because carbon dioxide lasts practically forever in the atmosphere. Whereas the end Permian took about 15 to 20 million years to happen, we are doing the same thing in really a matter of decades, a couple of hundred years at the most. So if, if the climate change deniers, if these powers, as I say, they're evil powers, I mean, what else can you call it? They are misinforming the media, they're disinforming and confusing the public with the sole aim of continuing to burn more and more and more fossil fuels. I mean, that's what they're doing this for. They're getting paid a lot of money, of course, for doing it obscene amounts of money. But this is what they're doing, and they are destroying the planet. They're totally destroying the planet. They are working to extract and burn all the fossil fuels that they possibly can. And this is nothing short of a global suicide agenda. There's no question about that. The science is so definite. These people know they're destroying the future. They're doing it for money and power. The American people have, over the past few years, gotten wise to the um, campaign of climate change denial. Of course, started, um, as I say, 1989-1990, started by the big fossil fuel corporations, also the big automobile manufacturing corporations in the United States. I want to stress that this denial campaign goes back that far. And ever since all it's done is grown and grown and grown, got more and more and more determined, more and more and more aggressive. It's been absolutely incredible to me to observe that over many decades now, as the science has made global climate change and ocean disruption more and more absolutely definite, that these people have gotten more aggressive. And at the same time, it's been totally incredible to me that as the impacts impact the planet more and more and more, and worse and worse and worse, including in the United States, climate change impacts have occurred on every continent and across all oceans. To all continents around the world, Peru right now is suffering under an unprecedented flood uh, covering vast regions of coastal Peru. That there were some studies done in the United States recently in which uh, more than 50% of people, of Americans, are now concerned about global climate change. And this actually is a big jump in the past just five or six years. They realized, the Americans increasingly realized how deceived that they've been and that climate change is something which is going to affect their families. Americans apparently uh, don't believe that it's going to affect them. Um, uh, that's understandable because the science has been moving so fast that whereas just maybe 10, 15 years ago, which is no time at all, the science was saying that, well, it's our children and grandchildren. Um, it's actually nearly all of us now who are going to be affected by global climate change. No one will be spared the impacts of global climate change. Billion dollar extreme weather events in the United States were rare. Now they're happening on a regular basis. And they're multi-million dollar events. They're happening year after year now in the United States. And of course, they're happening in other countries as well. The media has, from the very beginning, pretended that climate change didn't exist and is of no importance. So why, when they don't cover the greatest wildfires <laughs> in, in basically American history, uh, 
in March of 2017. Why are you disappointed? Aren't, shouldn't we all be angry? We should be furious that they're participating in our, in our death. <laughs> we should all be very angry about um, climate change and ocean acidification and ocean heating in general. We really, really should be angry about this. You're quite right. I'm talking about being angry at the media. I can think back, and it's now well known, that for many, many years, for decades, climate change was reported by the media pretty well across the board as a debate, right? Do you remember this, Jack? You know, year after year, month after month, the scientists would find something about climate change, which was very worrying and of great concern, and the media would report the story and say, some scientists believe that the climate is changing, right? I did want to say that um, the media done, has done a lot of lasting damage because for decades they presented climate change as something which we didn't really have to worry about because, um, it, because they gave the impression that it wasn't definite. They gave the impression that the scientists um, had not yet decided, right, whether um, global warming, whether global climate change was real. When in fact, the very first assessment in 1990 of the IPCC made it very clear that global warming was real and also made it <coughs> clear and definite in the statement that they made that continuing to emit greenhouse gas emissions into the atmosphere would increase global warming and climate change. This was a specific statement back in 1990. The greatest lie ever told in human history was President Trump on a televised interview ending the interview by saying, one thing is certain, Nobody knows whether climate change is real. And he repeated that, nobody really knows. So what I was saying was that this is now a formal government policy of the United States of America, that climate change doesn't count, the environment doesn't count, it's not in the top White House issues, and what counts is extracting all the fossil fuel that they can possibly extract. So this is the entire government of the United States now, uh, which, is, um, which has made it formal policy uh, to do nothing, to completely disregard global climate change, atmospheric greenhouse gas pollution, to completely disregard ocean heating, ocean acidification, the coral reefs. We've almost certainly lost the Great Barrier Reef. That's the latest news this year. And it goes on and on, the, the great forests, the Amazon. So they have written, these people have written all those off. These people have literally written the future off. And that now is the power which has taken control of the United States government. Um, the United States government is a catastrophe of its own. So we're now over one degree C. Um, this, was, uh, this was published, this got plenty of publicity uh, last year. And, uh, but the thing about one degree C is that it means because of the climate change science, which has been recorded, documented since 1990 with the first IPCC assessment again, it means that we're committed to up to double that amount of warming. And in actual fact, the IPCC AR5 did estimate that, we, that our, today's atmospheric greenhouse gases alone, or rather 2012's atmospheric greenhouse gases alone, commits the world, the right word now is condemns the world, to a global warming of two degrees C. We're past the danger threshold already. This is how dire this emergency is. Uh, a two degree C is absolute total catastrophe. Um, the two degree C danger limit um, has never been established by science. The world has also been led astray by this idea that two degrees C is a danger limit. And I have always written and, and, and always argued that two degrees C is disaster. And now we know it's absolute catastrophe. 
So one degree C is the danger limit, and we are at it. Everything is at stake. Everything. Um, certainly, everything that everybody truly does love, and everything we need uh, to survive, let alone our livelihood, everything is now at stake. Because everything is determined by climate. What is most particularly and most worryingly at stake is uh, our agriculture. In all regions, all major food producing regions and the world as a whole, crop yields are going to decline. So that's the sort of thing I've, I, I, I've feared for decades, that global climate change would be allowed to reach the point where crop yields would start declining. And of course, um, that is absolute social chaos. Um, and the Nature Journal carried an editorial, and the editorial was entitled, this was back in 2008, I think, CO2 is forever. That was the headline. And the scientists explain that, uh, with great concern, they explain the fact that the world didn't seem to be understanding the great significance of carbon dioxide. And the great significance of carbon dioxide is that there's nothing within the atmosphere that can remove carbon dioxide. There are no chemicals that can clean carbon dioxide up in the atmosphere. And so um, the removal of carbon dioxide from the atmosphere is entirely dependent on the formation of fossil carbon. And we are very familiar with fossil carbon because it's coal, oil, and natural gas. And we know it takes millions of years to form that fossil carbon. That's how long it takes for the Earth to remove carbon dioxide from the atmosphere. When we emit carbon dioxide, 20% of that carbon dioxide will still be in the atmosphere a thousand years from today. Good. The IPCC AR5 uh, reported in actual fact that it takes 100,000 years a hundred thousand years for all the carbon dioxide that we, that industrial civilization, that industrial civilization has been emitted, has emitted, to be removed from the atmosphere. So this is why the scientists have tried to get across to the public that carbon dioxide is forever. So what I started saying some years ago, because I knew how many people, um, their lives were ruined and were being, were being killed by air pollution, largely from fossil fuel combustion, what I started saying was that uh, fossil fuel combustion kills today, and now because of climate change kills forever. But this, 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 this is, we are looking at the most serious situation that our species has ever been in. We've been around for 250,000 years or so. We've been around for a long time. And um, uh, our ancestors were, uh, were great. I mean, they survived ice ages, and they survived all kinds of terrible stuff. And here we are. Um, but the Earth, let alone human species, the Earth has never experienced what's happening today and the pace at which it's happening today, right? I mean, we've had wars, terrible wars, civil wars, um, infections, plagues. Uh, what we're looking at is worse than all of those rolled in together. And I have to say that what we're looking at now because of what the United States government is doing. So um, there's no getting away from it. Uh, we are now in a situation at which the very survival of humanity is in question. People might be surprised to hear me saying that the survival of humanity is now in question because of the extent and the pace and the sky-high levels of atmospheric greenhouse gas pollution. Um, but this has been actually said many times before. Many scientists, leading scientists, um, have stated this. I mean, I could go back 15 years in which scientists have said that uh, it's really questionable whether the human species, with the way that industrial civilization was going, uh, powered by, you know, no, we've got this terrible destructive power from fossil fuels. 
that's another thing in, inherent in fossil fuels. Um, and uh, they said it was uh, in question whether humanity, whether our species, would make it until the end of the century. What is threatening to the survival of all humanity and almost all life on the planet is our tiny little um, uh, um, episode in time and in population of the fossil fuel industrialized period. We have to act on an emergency immediate basis to save nature, to save the earth, which of course means to save ourselves. And there are huge, highly financed powers which are constantly working to prevent that. And they're now put into sharp focus by President Donald Trump and his administration. We're looking at the entire biosphere being unraveled. The power of the carbon dioxide particularly, but also methane and nitrous oxide and some other greenhouse gases, the force in the lower atmosphere that builds up, it's building up and building up and building up all the time, right? Okay, because carbon dioxide lasts forever. Um, the force that that is building up is, uh, is gigantic and it's gigantically destructive. If we, um, if we love our children truly, if we love our grandchildren, we will all get engaged actively and energetically in this issue of all issues of all time. The earth has never experienced what is happening to the earth now. And I can remember, as I say, scientists writing about this 15 years ago. I can remember when um, uh, the, I think it was in 2008, when there was a big meeting of conservation scientists, and I think it was um, set up in the Boston Museum, I believe. And they made a statement. They issued this statement that we were in the sixth mass extinction of species on planet Earth. They also said that they thought it was probably the fastest mass extinction that there has ever been. The published science has now confirmed this. The published science just a couple of years ago uh, reported that the rate of extinction that our industrial civilization is bringing about is 1,000 times faster the natural background extinction rate. We are wiping out life on this planet at a terrible pace, even without global climate change. And the IPCC AR5 said that whatever scenario we follow, be it the best case scenario that we could follow that they published, which is immediate global rapid decline of emissions, whatever scenario we follow, this extinction is going to be made a lot worse. So we're in an emergency in a sense that we are going to suffer terribly. The planet is going to be terribly badly damaged. So that's the emergency that we're in. Um, people are still talking about save the planet. We can't save the planet anymore. The planet that I live in today is, is drastically different from the planet Jack you and I grew up in. And we should all be aware of this because, my God, the reports have come out year after year after year from the United Nations Environment Program, from the World Wildlife Fund that do a living planet index every year. Um, the rate of decline of all species in last year's WWF report was a sharp decline, getting sharper. Um, a paper has just been published that says if we don't get our emissions into decline rapidly, it's gone. We lose the Great Barrier Reef. We have killed the Great Barrier Reef. It's, uh, we should find this very hard to take. I think people don't find it hard to take because nobody even knows about it. I mean, it, to me, it passed completely unnoticed. I, I happened to get an email or something about it which alerted me. But other than that, from listening to the radio, reading the newspapers, watching television, I had no idea that any, any, 
anything of any importance had taken place, because that, I think, is how the media downplays the entire issue of climate change. But I do agree with you about the media, because I'll agree with, because there are so many scientific reports that I've seen in which they should have been headlines on the first page. And I say I don't read the, the newspapers, and I don't. But every so often, I do realize <laughs> where the media reports on the science that I read on the, on the internet, I do realize where they are. You know, they're sort of towards the back page sort of thing. There's no sense out there of how huge this is. None at all. So what are the biggest advertisers in the media? Well, it's very obvious. It's the automobile industry, right? It's, the automobile industry is all over the media, right? So what's the automobile industry doing? They're, they're building bigger and bigger vehicles. Constantly, they're building bigger vehicles. And we have to wake up in a hurry. And uh, we have to change now. I read over and over and over that the scientists leading the IPC said that emissions must have reversed, this was their quote, by 2015 at the latest to avoid catastrophic global climate change. We're in 2017 now, right? So catastrophic global climate change is now unavoidable. And nobody wants to say that. I know nobody wants to say it, but I also know it's the truth. From multiple lines of evidence, it's the truth. I could just take the coral reefs. I could just take the Great Barrier Reef. We are locked in to a planetary catastrophe. The Great Barrier Reef is going to die. It's actually dying. Um, it's suffering a major second-in-a-row bleaching event, unprecedented. And it sounds like it's a very severe, unprecedented event. The scientists have already determined that the 35 or 40 percent of the Great Barrier Reef which bleached, half of that is dead. So we have lost a very large proportion already of the Great Barrier Reef, a jewel of the planet. I, my God, we have, uh, we have searched the stars with our amazing technology. What have we found? We are the only life in the universe that we can find, right? No wonder previous religions and uh, no wonder the indigenous people all agree on one thing. Earth is sacred. We're a long, long way from that in our culture. The Paris Agreement was um, one of the United Nations uh, Paris conferences, and it was December of 2015 that the agreement was reached. That, that, that is actually one instance where the media hasn't got it right. And uh, they should have looked into the agreement a lot closer, or read through it a couple of times, otherwise they'd know that it's an agreement to do nothing. There were, there were critics and very strong criticism of the Paris Agreement. The, um, the climate justice groups, which are relatively small groups because they're from the most vulnerable nations and the indigenous, uh, they certainly had it right. Um, they, say, they said it was an agreement to do nothing and a huge letdown. The Friends of the Earth International um, and these were all statements from Paris, people who were actually there attending the conference. Uh, they described the agreement as a sham. And that's quite right, too. The Paris Agreement, in my view, was a huge success from the point of view of PR. It's absolutely amazing how the entire world took and um, accepted and went along with the statement that said that the, P that the Paris Agreement was historic. It was a big change. It was major progress. It's absolute nonsense. The Paris Agreement, firstly, nothing within the agreement is but legally binding. And we knew that from the start because the uh, American position under the Obama government insisted that it must not be legally binding, and the reason for that 
which I certainly don't agree with. Um, the reason for that was that the Republican um, uh, Party in the United States was powerful enough to stop it ever being ratified. So once that had been done, it was pretty obvious that uh, nothing good or nothing which we could really characterize as progress could possibly come out of, uh, of the Paris negotiations. What that would lead to, and this was calculated by the UN, um, the UN uh, Climate um, Secretariat, I can't remember how much publicity was given to this, but what that would lead to would, have, would be an increase in emissions in 2030. An increase in emissions by 2030, when the science has been telling us and told us very clearly and specifically in the 2014 IPCC agreement that global emissions had to be coming down now to avoid climate catastrophe. 2020 at the very latest. So what did Paris give us? It gave us no legally binding commitments to do anything, uh, so-called voluntary nationally determined targets, which would result in a substantial increase in emissions 2030. Now, how can anybody call that success? How can anybody call that progress? And yet, the PR people did their thing, and um, everybody, still to this day, to this day, whenever I read anything about the Paris Agreement in the media, it's always ter termed a historic agreement, a big turnaround. No, no, no. It was another, yet another, delay. It's, that's really bad. The entire world is being deceived. All the world believes that things aren't so bad because we have this strong Paris Agreement that we can move forward on. The Paris Agreement is absolutely deadly. It was, it was, it was, a, it was one death blow for progress um, towards preventing global climate catastrophe, total pl planetary catastrophe. The IEA did an estimate of what the greenhouse gas emissions by the energy industry globally alone would result in. By 2020, they calculated a 30% increase in energy-related greenhouse gas emissions. That's carbon dioxide, a fair amount of methane now because particularly of the natural gas industry expansion, all of the, um, uh, all of the fracking. Um, God, I mean, has there ever been a worse invention than fracking? No, no. Oh, it's unthinkable. And yeah, it is, it, fracking is, the, the, the whole planet is being fracked. The planet is being fracked to death. And um, uh, of course, President Trump um, it's his main policy. He's going to frack everywhere he can frack in the United States. It, it, it is global suicide. It, it will certainly bring the biosphere down if it's allowed. So this is the information I'm trying to get out with my um, uh, articles and my climate conferences and my YouTube that I try and do and the opportunity like this when I get to be able to do an interview and uh, communicate all the terrible information, the terrible data, which I collect on a, on a regular basis. The truth of this really, really has to be got out. Um, uh, it may be very convenient, it may feel very pleasant, you know, it may be, it may be reassuring that uh, we can pretend there's this big international agreement that has things solved, but we can't do this to our kids. You know, we can't do this to our children. We can't do this. We, we really do have to tell the truth. We cannot avoid 1.5 degrees C, all the scientists know that, and the IPC says that we are committed by 2012 greenhouse gases in the atmosphere to 2 degrees C. This means we're going to go over 2 degrees C. That is, even if the nations get their act together, get serious, and get emissions into decline, we're going over 2 degrees C. We can't avoid that. So, what's going to happen with extreme weather events? They are going to get um, worse on a, um, a biblical scale, has been um, mentioned um, by some scientists. They're going to be absolutely unbelievable. 
Um, the IPCC assessment um, uh, reported that, the, that, as you say, Jack, these extreme weather events are increasing. There's no question about that. Surely everybody knows. Um, uh, look, this shows how, um, how malicious, how evil these climate change deniers are. If we have global surface warming, if the temperature is going up on the surface of the planet, we are going to have more heat waves, right? That's inevitable. And we're going to have more forest fires. That's inevitable. And we're going to have more droughts. And we all depend, in order to live and survive, on the greatest of humanity's inventions, which is agriculture. So these people who are preventing real progress, any progress on emissions, these people like President Trump and his administration and the Republican Party in the States, these people are, are willing the collapse of agriculture on us. Now why are they doing that? Because of money. Because of our sort of uh, perverse kind of economics. Because it's a fact that food in America is incomparably cheap compared to oil in America. So it really comes down in the end, it comes down to our economics. But we can't let any of the governments off the hook because people again ask me, well, what can we do? You know, what do we do? Uh, we can turn this around um, on, literally on a dime if the countries of the world simply terminated their subsidies. Subsidizing the fossil fuel industry is not only insanity, um, it is the greatest crime against humanity, it's the greatest crime, crime against all humanity. It's a cosmic crime. It's a crime against the planet, it's a crime against our Earth. Thanks to the work of the International Monetary Fund, no less, we know that subsidies worldwide to the fossil fuel industry amount to trillions of dollars a year. Trillions of dollars a year. Our hard-earned tax money is being given to these fossil fuel uh, industries, which get financing from the corporate banks, by the way, Exxon's big into fracking, 80% of uh, the money that Exxon gets to invest on fracking is, is coming from the uh, private banks. So we are paying for our own death, our own funeral. That's literally what we're being forced. Um, you know, people are, people are reticent to get involved in global climate change. There's two reasons big reasons. One is the nastiness of the climate change deniers has uh, tarnished the idea of getting involved in global warming and climate change. So they have been maliciously clever in, in achieving that. The other thing is that people kind of feel it, it would be guilty for them, you know, to acknowledge that, I mean, I drive, right, you know, I go to conferences by airplane, right, okay. Um, uh, um, we can't be held back, you know, because we live within a fossil fuel dependent and, and dominated economy and country. We still have to act. And we know, thanks to some other experts, we know that all of the fossil fuel energy that we're, all of the fossil fuels that we're burning for energy can be 100% replaced by clean, safe, uh, so-called renewable energy, which should be called everlasting energy, really, right? Um, uh, and that's energy, by the way, which is going to be cheaper the more we use. That encapsulates everything that we have to know. The burning age is over. We can burn no more carbon. The idea that some scientists have put about that we have a, um, a, an allowable budget of carbon that we can still burn I know it's published science, and I also know it's nonsense, right? Um, it's nonsense for very, very many reasons, because of all the forest fires, because of all the droughts, because the crops are, 
are failing in, in many regions in Africa, crops are failing now because we've got negative effects on the crops in all the major food producing regions because the Arctic sea ice is melting away at record rate because this month of March 2017, the Arctic sea ice is at its third record low, and for the first time, we have a record low for the Antarctic sea ice. I could go on and on why we can't be burning any more carbon, right? The burning age is over.